Welcome. We're going to rebrand this. It's acceptance and testing for a quality turnover to sustainable operations and maintenance. So commissioning made easy. <laughs> I'm your host for the day, Paul Raskila from AKF. I'm also a EMP certified through the ACG. And my colleague, Jules Willinger. So uh, Jules and I have been working together for over three years now. Uh, combined, we have about 35 years, 40 years commissioning experience. Um, personally, I started my commissioning in the Navy. So went from the Navy to manufacturing, from manufacturing to pharmaceutical. Nice reliability, redundancy, commissioning process, a lot of validation, qualification. Then I got out into the built environment. And I was like, whoa, what happened to quality assurance? So I started looking around, found this place called ACG, ABC, or some others. You know, ASHRAE had a commissioning handbook. It's like, there's got to be some guide out there. Don't you guys do quality assurance in buildings? So I said, yeah, we do. Okay, so now that we're all on one page, how can we do it as a team? So that, with our lessons learned from the different sectors, environments, and not necessarily just from what we learn on a project, but contractually, how do we line up the responsibilities? And that's what we're going to talk about today. For me, I was in the military, so it depends, right? As commissioning agents, engineers, authorities, we get taught, pat answer is it depends. Was this successful to get the astronaut up there? Was the project successful if he comes back home? Which engineer didn't calculate the meteor about to hit him? You know, so you figure all this stuff out. So it really depends. What's your scope, schedule, fee on the job? Getting everyone to collaborate together and get through it. So one of our first tasks is really identifying with the team what's successful to you. What we're seeing today is a change, slight shift toward a better understanding and commissioning leadership up front. What's the purpose of commissioning for this project? Have you done commissioning before? What do you need to get out of it today? So fit for purpose commissioning. You know, by failing to, pre to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So Ben Franklin was a commissioning guy. You know, he understood. You got to prep, you got to plan, you have to co coordinate, collaborate, and then work the plan to get a desired result. What level of commissioning is needed? We're getting asked more and more, well, what level of commissioning are you buying? Well, what are you pricing? We're getting a lot of RFPs that don't even ask for hours. So it's just a lump sum number. The systems aren't clearly defined. So what we're trying to do is really that commissioning leadership for the owner, for the design team. Do you need to commission all your systems and all your different types of equipment to the same level? No. We could perform a risk assessment together. You know, ASHRAE outlines the process. Uh, mission critical data center industry really lays it out. Level one, factory acceptance testing. Two, three, four. Level three is usually where we end up around for energy systems on lead. Level four, you start taking your HVAC systems, tying them into your life safety systems. So now you're getting some integrated system testing, not just the different equipment and systems. And level five, we're really seeing that with more biosafety labs, data centers, mission critical, where you have maybe like 2N redundancy, reliability. But for us, we explain to our clients, you have a project, right? You have scope, schedule, fee. But now for each of those systems, what's the risk associated with it? What happens if that system goes down? Odds are if a dimmer goes down or isn't functioning fully, it's going to be a little different than if your ER goes down or your biocontainment goes down. So it's really having a better understanding of your project so you get that fit to purpose commissioning and buy it right. Put the money in your budget where you need it, basically. So learning objectives for today. We will try to learn how to use commissioning to supplement the planning, design, and construction process. All right, AIA has a very nice design outline. It's called what, design, construction, and commissioning. By all means, let's collaborate. <laughs> what your perspective is useful for everyone else. How, do, as a team, do we get a better systems outcome? 
One of the key closeout steps, based on our experience using the guidelines and what we're seeing in the field, for how do we get through for better operations and maintenance? How do we line up the project contract responsibilities? Right? You bind the design team here, RFP goes out. Ashy says, we recommend to the owner for health facilities to buy the commissioning agent first, authority. Get them in, let's do a proper design charrette. Let's make sure our performance requirements are actually written up, documented, and then go out to bid for the design team that's appropriate for that project. Then we could start talking about contractors, GCs, but let's keep lining it up. Learn about the basic tasks required for quality acceptance and turnover. I'm a former plant engineer at Columbia University. 20 years later, they're still having the same problem. Something different about design and construction-minded people from operations-minded people. They could sit back to back in the same cube. It doesn't matter. Different languages. And even in our own company, we see it with design engineers versus commissioning engineers. It's a different language. So we're relying more on commissioning engineers to be the translator on that collaboration team. All right. Commissioning guidelines for facilities management. Uh, one of the items we try to get through is really understanding what level of perspective and understanding does the owner have? Does the chief on site have? Who's actually getting this turnover? If you could help narrow that down, it helps out a lot. What level of training do they have? Are they an ACG person? You know, do they understand APA? They come from the high red side. Do they understand ASHI from hospitals, labs, maybe Lab 21? Find out what level of commissioning. Maybe they just understand ASHRAE. But the key thing is to bring them aboard and say, OK, we start with ASHRAE. Then each of our guidelines and handbooks add to it, depending on the specific sector or environment. But for your job, we might have to pull from three or four sources. It's not, commissioning is not an all or nothing deal. It's really, what do you need for your project? And how can we deliver that for sustainable operations and compliance? We're finding if you sell an understanding of compliance to the owners, that it's being better received. Uh, and if we're finding that the engineer of record with the design team can actually give us an energy benchmark from their energy model, and we have some way of doing an MNV for that first year, that's helpful. So if we're able to deliver sustainable operations, show that the project met energy expectations, and that you're in compliance for ongoing operations. Let's face it, they're building something to use it to do something else. End of the day, it's usually to get money. So if we show them commissioning helps with reduced downtime, more profitability, deliver dollars per bed, deliver you know, cost per student, energy cut. If you could talk in their language, once you understand it, it's better for everybody. So when does closeout start? In your head on a typical project. So understanding when closeout starts, if you have a schedule, if you're bidding a project, then there, it doesn't explain anything about closeout. It says occupancy but the contractors aren't bought in for the whole spec. It's really for us to help identify that. Looking at RFPs as they come through, we're finding that more and more we need a formal acceptance and turnover process. You know, and, that, and that's why Jules and I are here with ACG. You know, a lot of other guidelines, you know, our ACG commissioning guideline really spells out a separate, distinct acceptance phase. And once you have that, that's where you could bring everything together and you tie up the loose ends. So now you have a gatekeeper of sorts, a milestone, that you could say, all right, construction phase is ending. I have this transition piece called acceptance to get to occupancy. And the key is to improve the end user transition into the new space. Right? How do we get more jobs? What's successful? Reduce the amount of hot and cold calls. Make it easier for the people to move into the space. Let the project building use the energy as expected, or even save some. Verify that the contractor installed what was bought by the owner. Right? There's a nice quality assurance spec section in, in each division. However, who's really responsible for delivering that? 
we're finding more and more that the commissioning engineer has to be that, how should I say, uh, leader on the team. So bringing that engineering leadership and pointing out, you need to do your troubleshooting first. That's on you for quality assurance before we could get to finishing out pre-functional, before you could even think about balancing. You have to have your point-to-points done on your BMS. So really, it's up to us to be that translator, lend sequence to the process, not get involved with the means and methods, but bring the team through so that everyone's doing it the first time the right way so that we don't have to go back and retest. But clearly, signal installation completion and warranty start dates. Now, warranties, we're seeing when we get to review them at the end of the job, what are you talking about? Your warranty didn't start 10 months ago. You know, we just energized. We didn't accept the piece of equipment yet. So really helping the owner understand what was bought and when it starts. Reduce the amount and cost of proposed change orders. The owner relies on us invariably. Uh, a lot of times, Jules was telling me uh, many of his projects, the design team, let's face it, we don't have enough fee in CA. Right? And as we go through it, it's more difficult to get design-related issues fully vetted as a full team later in the project. And day two, day three type items, once people start moving into the building, design intent kind of gets very gray very fast. So we want to make sure that the owner has all the information needed to hold the contractors accountable. If that pump's not performing, if we still had 20 issues related to the BMS, that they're not paying for service tickets when it should have been covered under warranty. O&M training for energy and compliance. There are some nice data out there that shows three years after like a lead platinum building or any high energy sustainable building was put together, within three years it's using twice the amount of energy. Equipment gets put in hand, a lot of bypassed, we're not doing the maintenance on it, they don't have enough full-time staff. The people who are actually trained on how to run it are no longer there. So that, that ongoing commissioning is finally starting to really sink into people's heads that we have to come back, almost like a commissioning audit, come back periodically, do continuous commissioning, ongoing commissioning, some sort of monitoring-based commissioning, and really we have a lot of great software tools out there. Understanding how to identify the pitfalls or the big energy users without having to do a full retro commissioning every year. Hardest point that we probably argue on site is really getting the contractors to understand, and maybe not the GC, maybe not the, the CM, but the sub and the sub-sub and the vendor. Commissioning is a process. It's not a point in time. Right? Regardless of when you hire us, we still have our due diligence to do a certain level of review to understand the full scope. However, it chaps me a little bit when I see a master schedule and there's like a two-week window at the end, commissioning. You know, that's in a lot of people's mind. It's something way out there that other people are going to do. No, we're building quality assurance from day one. And if we could explain that to the owner, the value add of having us early on and part of the design process so that now we're going through the reviews, lending that third party objectiveness, the o &M staff doesn't have the time to do it. They might be getting the drawings for review, but the comments are short. They don't have the time. So that's where we can be an augmenting augmentation for them as a staff augmentation for o &M reviews, getting the information from them to give to the design team, fleshing out those design charrettes. You know, and as you go through, just really outline to the whole team, commissioning is this whole thing. We're here to help you at any point in the project. It's not just a matter of bringing us in at completion or occupancy or just for a startup. So if you could realign and give that commissioning leadership to people on the team. So what we're finding is how do we make an impact early on so that we have a better chance for that good quality turnover at the end? 
starts with our specs, right? We use the general commissioning for MEP fire protection systems, uh, section 0191. Uh, you guys probably all use that, right, or are familiar with it. So what we started doing is really looking at the other related specs and asking the question, well, wait a minute. You have uh, 013, 300 submittals. Let me see your submittal process. You know, I'm using a commissioning software tool. Uh, the contractor is using uh, one sort of construction management tool. The owner has something else that everyone needs to use for submittals. How is that process actually coordinated for this project based on our contracts? You know, closeout procedures, okay. What's listed in closeout procedures might be very different than what's in our contract for commissioning versus the contractors versus the design teams. And it might not be specific to what the owner needs for operations on that project. Operating and maintenance data. A lot of times we see a master spec for that that's not fine-tuned for how the client needs it for their ongoing uh, work order system or uh, CMMS. A lot of our guidelines talk about energy commissioning. Right. How many pieces of energy equipment are tied to electrical? Pretty much all of them, right? But electrical commissioning doesn't always happen. A lot of clients understand lead and energy and uh, international energy code. But what about the other systems, the ancillary systems, all the systems that get integrated? Even if you're not buying full commissioning from a provider, you should still have commissioning in the spec so that the client can enact it later. All right, that's part of the buyouts now. You can have a reduced level of commissioning on electrical systems. Let's face it, we want to have a higher degree of certainty that my electrical system will actually work and protect my new chiller, my HVAC systems. So tie that together, and if you're doing fire alarm systems, right, they're going to get tied in with your HVAC system. So really have that vendor on the hook to help out with that integrated system testing. Building envelope. How many new projects have we seen where building envelope did not get enacted? Right? But you go in, HVAC systems don't have a shot. If your envelope's bleeding through, you can't make up temperature, and it's incredibly difficult for the whole team. Who gets blamed? Usually the mechanical engineer first, and then we go through the systems. But it's a quality assurance program for building envelope it should still be bought out on some level. We're seeing the architect retain that a lot. But identify who's given the quality to the project. Make that entity part of the commissioning team. What we're seeing on site, typical client project phases. So now we're trying to explain, you know, how you're buying work from your design team and what you're contracting your construction team to do doesn't match anything that you bought from us in our commissioning RFP. Can we really line this stuff up? Take a look at the owner's design guides. They list phase one, pre-design, then schematic design, 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 design. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna do some CA, right? From speaking to my partners on the design side, you know, the fee runs out about a quarter of the way through CA. It's just a fact. But what about this other stuff? What about construction and acceptance? You know, what about startups? Does the design team have to witness factory tests? Are they going to be out there for the startups? Are they going to be part of the commissioning team? What's actually bought into their contract? What about the warranty period? You know, so that's what we see come out in the RFP. What we would like to really see is flesh it out a little more. Let's get everyone on the same page with commissioning and construction. These are our recommended commissioning and testing phases. You have that programming phase. Let's make sure we can line up the performance requirements. Design bid phase. Make sure the construction documents are lining up to deliver intent. Construction phase. Make sure what's actually built for that as installed situation meets intent and performance. And then clearly outline that acceptance phase like ACG does. Hold people accountable. 
at that time, come together, collaborate, understand the systems as installed, and hold any integrated systems tests, and then post occupancy warranty phases. Each one of these phases has a different perspective. So what we would like to see is just break it out so that you could deliver it, and at the end of the day, you know it was successful. So what we're asking today is let's, as a team, work to have acceptance as a milestone. When you talk to the owner, when you bid a job, when you review a construction schedule, make sure you have that point in time. For us, a formal acceptance is the most important milestone in construction closeout. It really delineates. You were building, now we're going to start transitioning. Because then the projects, you always see it, the demobilization, right? The really good guy who knows how to build is gone. You're lucky if you get a skeleton crew from the GC. You want to hold the right people on the project so that we can get through it. TCO doesn't mean close out and go away. That's just really the start. And we all know buildings and systems operate differently in different seasons and as they get loaded. Right? How many times have you had a stupid laser jet printer put right underneath a T-stat and you can't maintain temperature in that wing. It's just simple things like that. And we don't care who does it, just make sure someone's identified as that acceptance authority for the team. Clear contract expectations for acceptance, turnover, and closeout. Your performance requirements, plus you base the design. Do your construction documents actually deliver both? We confirm that through the commissioning process. Check. Then we verify the installation, we validate the performance, and then we can accept. A big hang up that we're seeing out there is the owner wants to accept everything at the same time. No. All right, it's heating season. My heating systems are done. We can accept fully or partially that. I'll see you in July and August. We'll talk about cooling systems. So this is where we can lead and really deliver the value for the owner. Make sure that they're getting what they paid for and we're proving out the systems in a logical, sequential, effective manner. We developed a roadmap to final acceptance uh, based on all the guidelines and problems that we've seen. What we're finding is during initial system acceptance, that's pretty much where most owners and contractors think the job ends. Right? We did some QA spec testing. They might have done some measuring, some balancing, some point to points. The vendors did their installation checks and startup reports. We did some functional testing. But then we have those items in the spec called, you know, like integrated systems test, right? NFPA 3 and 4 now for fire alarm, fire protection systems. You have to do integrated system test. You have to do commissioning. That ties to HVAC. So the systems are getting so much more complex Right? They're getting integrated and interconnected. So we have to go a little above and beyond and fully dive into all those different modes of operation, normal and non-normal, and prove them out. Seasonal testing. It's in the spec. When are we going to do it? Are we holding money for it? Closeout documents. What does the team need to run this building to train new staff to go back and research? Training completed. And final system acceptance. So when you put all that together, usually that final system acceptance, most of our scope calls to be there for a 10-month walkthrough, right? Or end of first year warranty. Some warranties go two seasons, so that's two years. That final system acceptance might happen three years after the fact. But it's really understanding the scope and the contract. So do our contract deliverables match responsibilities? What do you mean by that? Well, usually we only look at our contract with the owner. And the rest of the time, we're fighting everyone else's contract when they say, oh, well, I don't have that in my scope. Well, you, no, you got to do that on your own. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Why do you buy something from us that no one else has bought in on? So what are the expectations for closeout and turnover? Well, let's face it. If the contracts don't line up by phasing, if not everyone's bought in for understanding the same level of commissioning for systems, when we do our responsibility matrix, it gets very tough very quickly. 
Is the commissioning authority the acceptance authority? A lot of times we see the president of the hospital or the university or the CFO signs off as acceptance. Like, wait a minute, why is that in the contract? That person might be very qualified to accept. However, really, how many project meetings did they come to? How well do they understand the issues? Or you get the other side of it. This engineer on site was the only one there that day. He signed. Oh, you accepted. No, that's not how it's going to happen. Is there overlap between the engineer of record, commissioning, and the other AHJs or inspection services? Let's help the owner buy our services effectively. We don't need four of us sitting there watching a pump startup. You know, you're sitting there. That good for you, Joe? That good for you, Kelly? Yeah, let's see it one more time. It's, no, you need one of your professionals there, right? But trade off. Get buy-in early on at the spec time in those earlier uh, spec deliverables in Division I. Who will attend which systems? Who is going to the factory test? Do we need any vendors in the room? All right. So do we need the vendor to buy in 20 people to go witness a factory test? No, we could help out. We could do some remote, take some video, have one or two qualified people there, depend on the criticality of it. Let's help the owner save some money once in a while. But payment retainage. Okay, so what's our value? We're consultants. Right? We get the letters because we get paid by the initial sometimes. So <laughs> the biggest way we could add value is make sure that the client is getting what they paid for and what they intended to get. So help them when it comes bid time to level their scopes of work. If we know we're going to ask for let's say a 36 hour pull the plug on the generator systems. Make sure that's a separate line item for the contractors to put money in for. If we know we have seasonal testing and you can't do a final balancing until you go through winter and summer, make sure you have three to four balancing points in there for pricing. Hold it, understand it, and sit with the owner when they're doing invoicing. How many times have you seen an owner get charged 70% for the tin on site. I walk over to the owner and say, hey, you know that's not your tin. Like, what are you talking about? No, that's for the project down the block. They're using your building as a warehouse. It's like, are you serious? I say, yeah, come here. And you see the tag right on the sheet metal. It's a different project. So help the owner <laughs> just understand better what's going on on their site. You know, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, point it out. If we are truly third party working for the owner. It's our job to help the owner with the design team. So early on, we need to come to an understanding and understand their scope. They hopefully understand ours and work as a team. How can we help offset them during CA phase by making the submittal process a little better? Maybe as a team holding the contractors accountable for not submitting stuff that they know isn't proper or if they have you know, alternates in there, that they clearly outline it so that we could refuse it or accept it early on. Not go through six submittals, because, or ask the owner not to have so many meetings. You know what? We only had 10 meetings total in fee between the design teams and us. Why are we having 20? Why are you having one a week now? So if we can help each other by understanding each other's scope on the project, End of the day, there's one person sitting there with the money. That's the owner. Might be 30 of us, might be a room this big on a bigger project. The owner's the only one with the cash. So how do we help that owner have a successful project so we all get invited back together? Sample closeout guidelines. I would like you to ask the owners on site, do you have a sample closeout guideline? Do you have a closeout guideline you use? If so, may I see it so I could tailor our commissioning process to what you need? Uh, this is just two examples, one from Harvard Planning and Project Management, one from NYU School of Medicine. And if they don't, upsell a little bit. Say, you know what? We're going to spend a little extra time. We're going to help develop an outline for you for future use because we like working here so much and help them out. And then you tell them, well, that's going to cost too much money. <laughs> so you say, all right, we'll help you get funded. 
do you have a line item for commissioning in your new construction project capital? No. All right, well, we could work with you on a budget. You want to do percentage of construction or something? You need to put it in. Deferred maintenance project capital. Okay, well, we're doing a fit out, but we're tying it to an existing air handler. I don't want to get to the end of the project right before TCO to find out that existing air handler doesn't have the capacity. So really put into your commissioning plan and understanding, we need to baseline that equipment. And if it's no good, we need to buy it in with either deferred maintenance capital on the same schedule or as part of the project as an ad alternate. Energy project incentives. We're seeing a lot of great incentives out there. Right? Some uh, states are even paying two cents to five cents per KW for commissioning effort. So just have a better understanding of what's available. Uh, track energy savings to fund O&M. Um, biggest pitfall we're seeing on site. We have a lot of great engineers working at buildings, a lot of great energy managers doing a lot of great stuff to save energy, but they forget to benchmark. They don't talk the ROI, the money end of it, to the C-suite so that they could say, you know what, boss? We had this much money. We spent it. We saved this much in energy. It paid for itself in three months. Can you save that money and send it into a fund for me so I could do more projects like that? So we're seeing that gain a lot of traction. Marketing and fundraising demands. We're seeing a lot of uh, new initiatives being called out. We want to be a well building. We want this. We want to be sustainable. We want to beat ASH rate 90 by this percent. We want to, someone left us a lot of money, but it's a million dollars that has to go to solar. You need to put solar in the project somewhere. Um, CHP programs, there's a lot of money out there lately for that. Um, and implement metering and verification. Even if you don't need it for a credit, doesn't it make sense to know how much energy you're using and where in a building so that you could identify the problem areas later on? So at just some level, understand your energy boundaries and how can you track what utilities are going in and out of those blocks. So when you get on site, have the candid discussion. We know design, guy, design construction people don't talk to the operations people until too late, right? until halfway through the warranty maybe. Get them at the table. Talk to them behind their backs. Get some information out of them so you could use it on your team. Does the facility have a turnover protocol? Yeah, but we never use it. All right, well, hand it to me. Let me mark it up as we go on this project. Maybe we'll get a usable document out of it. How do you close out a job? What's successful for your purchasing department? What's successful for your boss? What's successful for operations? What's successful for environmental health and safety? Do they have checklists? Ask for them. Who's responsible for accepting? What internal documents do you have to get updated? You know, we see that a lot uh, for life safety plans, compliance, space management plans. You just redid a whole wing. You got to make sure that gets updated, especially in hospitals or laboratory environments. Can the house maintain and test all this stuff? We're seeing highly specialized equipment go into buildings on retrofit jobs, but no one on site knows what that equipment is, how to maintain it. Help them buy in a service contract for the first couple of years. And get operations involved in the project before getting the first hot and cold call. Demand it, ask for it. Find who that person is, your champion, and bring them to the table with you. Don't let anyone else see you because of the politics and everything else going on. But the key thing, end of the day, it's one institution, one client, one project. You need to get that information to the table. We ask you during the RFP process, if you're putting out RFPs or responding, if something's not clear, point it out. We're seeing this type of information come out. All right, professional services. Commissioning will be provided to ensure HVAC systems, electrical, boom, boom, boom. You know, and we want to make sure that people are all properly trained on the new equipment. But they have to be a CXA, right? All right, so now they're talking ACG. Then they're referencing ASHRAE. There's a lot of stuff in there. And then they had a separate outline of what equipment's supposed to be included. And it had a couple of fans and a pump. So it's like, wait a minute. Really understand and align what's being asked. What is that scope schedule fee? And make sure that the rest of the team members have the same 
amount in there. Right? More and more we're seeing uh, ask for a lump sum number. Right? So we tell them, okay, you have three systems you want commissioned. May I give you hours as well? You know, and break it up by phase. Sure, you could do what you want. We might not look at it. You know, if your company, your firm does something special, you know, put that in as an ad alternate. Sell yourselves. Maybe they're not asking for electrical or life safety commissioning. They're only looking at energy. But how many people in the room ever heard of someone getting sued for using too much energy at a hospital? All right, people get sued because life safety systems don't work. The elevator opened up on the wrong floor during a fire alarm condition. Why? No one commissioned it. That's where we could come to the table. And if you lose it on fee, so be it. But I guarantee you, sooner or later, they understand the delta, the differential, and the professionalism that you bring to the table. Client project closeout, standard creation. As you're going through, you know, a lot more international energy code is being applied across the country. Right? A lot of municipalities are just saying, we're going to do it. So international building code follows these discrete steps for planning and design, peer review, construction phase activities, testing phase activities, standard reports, and occupancy plan. Right? A lot of our tests yesterday, we had to add the existing building end of it for the energy and understanding that you're working in a live environment and how do you get through that. So if you see something that you recommend the client should do, if they're not asking you to perform it, ask them, hey, who's doing your peer review? This is a pretty, it's a data center. Is someone else doing a peer review on here? You're just buying us out for commissioning on construction phase activities. We recommend this, we recommend that. So you have a chance to show that commissioning leadership once again. Understand who's part of your team. Right? We're going to lead the commissioning and acceptance team management, but how do we get that cooperation and collaboration from across the board? There might be one entity out there like environmental health and radiology safety that they have to do a final walkthrough and, and come in. Get that knowledge earlier than later. You know, is there a campus architect that's going to say, you know, you can't put a louver there? Understand that early and often. Understand the other service providers. You know, some municipalities like New York and Vegas, they need special inspectors. You don't want to have the same guys showing up to do the inspections at the same time. You know, buy it. All right, we're going to look at the first audits. You guys have to witness 100%. We're going to, you know, sample some of the duct leakage testing. As a team, how do we get the best product? So when you take all that into account, we want to develop an acceptance and turnover plan. Right? And what's the goal? We're commissioning leaders. We want to help coast from construction to operations. So now you're making that transition. Construction was happening. Now we're going to go toward operations. Coordinate with design, operations, commissioning, and the contractors. Organize have a formal acceptance, sequence it the right way in the schedule, and then transition. Right? You really want to go from performance requirements to operation. All right, everything that got installed over here works. It functions. Performance, it's good. Your bearings are good. But this is how you're going to operate it. You know, we still recommend you're going to work in that normal mode of operation 95% of the time. We still recommend that you test once a month your life safety systems. We still recommend that you check these non-normal conditions. Let's face it, the owners love it when we add luster to the project, right? Why do they hire us? Because we make commissioning fun, because we love what we do. So as a team, we want to make sure that their project's nice and shiny, right? People move in, they're happy, they say, wow, that was a great project. We need more of those. We're so happy to move into this space. I'm, it's so better than when I was in the dungeon. Keep your logs active. Understand what's still out there to be fixed. You know, update operations on progress. Summary of the accuracy and completeness of each system. You know, we don't have to turn them all over together, but each system that you do, understand what did get tested, what you weren't able to test, what we couldn't test, what we had to defer on testing, track it, encourage the early development of closeout documentation. 
we understand that a lot of contractors hold that last report for payment terms and stuff. But for us to do our job right, we really need the O&M information earlier than that so that we can line up our functional test, so that we can line up the training, so that we could get that turnover package. And receive compliance and energy training. Right? You don't want to walk by a month later, two months later, and see all your VFDs in hand. You want to make sure that the systems are operating. You don't want to jump on the BMS and see 150 alarms bypassed or, you know, just... Why put all that money into a system? Why persecute us for three and a half years as a team if you're not going to let it run the way it's intended? So now that you added some luster, you want to close that loop with operations, right? Who's actually getting the acceptance and turnover? They are. Someone else might be paying you, but they have to operate it. We were designing construction for three to four years. They're going to be running for 20 to 30 years. Corrective action plan. What happens if something goes wrong during warranty? You don't want them yelling at you because they had to get a different pump guy in to fix something. You want them to call the same pump guy to do the corrective action work and let them know, hey, that was an issue before. They never finished it. Line up O&M repair and management. Make sure that all these pieces, parts are now in their computerized maintenance, that the work orders get generated, that they're buying the right filters. Now select a responsible champion for the effort. Maybe that's you. You know what? Hey, Bill, you guys are too busy. Let me run that for you. I'm going to come back once a month. We're going to go through the open issues until we get through warranty. OK? OK. And here's my proposal. But you know, <laughs> help them out. It's going to help you close it out faster. It's probably worth just doing. Establish compliance and energy metrics. How do you know this was successful? How do we know we're using the right amount of energy? How do we know that it's actually performing and if you're not having those conversations and at least benchmark and baselining what's expected for operations? So we're talking money. As professionals, consultants, we're hired to do a job. So we're ensuring follow-up and transition to operations. All right, the key thing about us is we're there after the construction's over. We're there building long-term relationships with the owner. We're there, and we want to be invited back. We're really glad to be there. And we really excel at finding problems, right? We're on the commissioning end of the spectrum because we like seeing stuff that works. So invite the parties. Make it a party, right? They're parties on the contract. Call it a party. We're having an acceptance party. You know, we're having a transition party. But give them a clear agenda. Have sign-in. Let them know what you expect them to bring. If you need keys, manuals, you know what? A Hey, Jack, I, I understand you gave us a lot of pieces, parts over the last six months. Do me a favor. Put it all in a box and bring it with you for this meeting. Sign in. Understand the open issues. We simply can't do a final acceptance until next July. I'm going to hold 5% on you because you did such a great job on the rest of the stuff. And any exceptions to your equipment and systems. You know what? You really wanted a chilled water system that had glycol in it. We decided you didn't need it. We never cleaned up the spec. I need a letter from the engineer rele releasing guys. OK, but understand. And in summary, right, we want to get, as a team, a quality acceptance and turnover for operations. Each project requires an acceptance turnover plan for closeout. Clearly identify the roles and responsibility of each project team member. Right, this is a little above and beyond a responsibility matrix. Highlight contract deliverables during scope review and kickoff meetings. Ask to go. I know it costs us a little extra to be there during a bid review meeting or to review the contractor's Schedule 3As when they're buying trades, but how many times they don't buy commissioning? You know, it, it's just going to help you lead that commissioning effort later on if you have a better input and better idea of what they're buying. Make sure someone is understood to be that acceptance authority. Maybe it's different people for different systems. Maybe for your generator system, the house has someone on site who just runs that. Life safety, someone else. Electrical, someone else. Plumbing might be someone else. Maybe it might be you. Have a better understanding of the compliant docu compliance documentation. End of the day, especially in hospitals, right, the nurses know the smoke boundaries. They understand what to do. Operations, a lot of times, isn't as informed. 
You know, when you hear that bell go ringy, dingy, dingy, you want everyone to know what that means. Right? When your ATSs swing over and you see the lights flicker for a little bit, you want everyone to understand they're in a non-normal mode and why. So really have that training done before people move in. You don't want to have partial acceptance if you can avoid it. Right? That's where you start piercing warranty and other items. If the contractors are using the HVAC systems because they have mill work going in to get their job done, that's not on the owner. You know, help enforce that everything has to be cleaned out. We need new filters. We still have to do functional testing. Improve project management, change management, and the end user, whatever, end user environment. Understand what, what spaces these guys are going into, whether it's lighting, whether it's cooling, whether it's daylighting three rows in. Understand from the end user's perspective what they need to do. They're going to be sitting there every day showing up for work. We want to make either the patient, the doctors, uh, the students, anyone coming in, uh, the traders on a big floor, you know, the data center guys, tell the data center guy, you don't really need light. You're not going to be in that room. Can we turn off the lights? <laughs> Let the light come on when you go in the space. But help them save energy, help them get what they bought, and help them understand what they really needed. So closeout for us starts at the pre-design programming phase. We don't feel that a design team should be bought out until the owner knows what they actually want to buy. So thank you, everybody. On behalf of Jules and me, we're glad to be here.